let me tell you about our next speaker. He's a man of opposites and contradictions. He's a pediatrician who works with the elderly. He desires social change, yet he runs a for-profit startup. He's trying to raise money, but he is known to bash Silicon Valley. So how do those opposites converge or reconcile? The answer has to do with his vision for digital health. Please welcome Andre Ostrovsky. Thank you, everyone. Uh, incredibly, incredibly big honor to be here. Um, really exciting to take the stage with a lot of really impressive people that have shaped my own career. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about quality improvement and why it's QI and not the unicorn that everyone is talking about that's actually going to change healthcare. Um, important disclosure, I will share some data uh, that stems from research that my company does, but most of the data I'll share is from peer-reviewed research. Um, and another important disclosure is that I'm a pediatrician, even though I mostly talk about the aging population, so take everything I say with a grain of salt in that regard. <laughs> so yeah, if anyone decides to go down, I can do resuscitation, but don't, don't expect me to manage your hypertension. Um, don't, don't go down. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I want to highlight briefly, from a physician's perspective, reimbursement is changing fundamentally. And this figure is just borrowed from CMS. And what it demonstrates is the dark blue, which is alternative payment models. In other words, the way we do care and how we get paid for it is fundamentally changing. Things like bundled payment, accountable care organizations. That lighter blue is still fee-for-service reimbursement, but there's some quality flavor to it, like a readmission penalty or a quality penalty or a bonus, but still fee-for-service. And that white part is just straight fee-for-service, so you, more volume means more money for the doctors and the hospitals. And what's really encouraging is that, although there's major flaws with how we actually are getting the shift to happen, it's happening. So we're, we're actually seeing hospitals doctors, other providers change how they practice because how we get paid is changing. Uh, and that is going to be more and more so throughout the next few years. I want to delve a little bit into some of the quality aspects here. So we have quality based on actual clinical care, adherence to evidence-based practice, kind of common sense stuff, right? I just finished residency training. Everything I was trained was evidence-based practice, evidence-based practice, even though pediatrics, it's kind of gray area of evidence, but still, it's all about evidence-based practice. There's also quality measures around cost, cost effectiveness. Are we doing evidence-based practice in an efficient way? There's, and this is what I'm referencing here, the merit-based incentive uh, payment program. So this is proposed rules. This isn't for sure how things are going to move forward, but likely there will be similar types of ties of outcomes, efficiency, patient-centeredness, and improvement is a big, big component of this. Are we improving the way that we're providing care? And also incentives for meaningfully using health IT. Now, major limitations and designs of all quality measurement and incentives around technology and care, but still, this is a net positive thing that's happening. Uh, digital health is fundamental to health care. Now we have you know, clinical care, and then we have apps and technologies, and they are all becoming one and the same thing. We've gotten a lot of lay media attention. There is starting to become research focused on digital health technology. And I can tell you, as someone who grew up in academia, by the time researchers are starting to research things, it means it's kind of like too late. <laughs> we, we missed the ball. It's, it's, it, if if uh, Harvard researchers are starting to look into things, it means we should have probably addressed the policy implications three years ago. So now, if researchers are doing research on digital health, it, it's, it's clearly here and here to stay. An important consideration, though, is I just told you about how physicians are getting paid, hospitals are getting paid. Digital health is a critical part of that ecosystem, and quality pickles everything. Evidence-based practice pickles everything. And yet, this is how digital health is measured in terms of quality. Money, dollars, investment dollars in particular. So right now, what this is highlighting, and colleagues, my colleagues from Startup Health, which is, I think, the largest digital health incubator at this point, uh, uh, summarized some data. And this is data from last year. And I referenced last year's data because I'll uh, show you guys some research that we did on that data. And what they're highlighting 
is how much money did investment in each city make? And so by this measure, San, the Bay Area, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, is the mecca, right? That's where the most money flows. What kind of quality measure is that? Right? This is where all the attention, and attention is being paid in digital health. This is what I referenced in terms of all of the unicorns. The investors are looking for that unicorn, that $1 billion solution. I can't tell you how many times I go into an investor's office or I have a conference call and they say, well, tell me how you're going to get to $1 billion valuation. And I candidly always told them, like, I will never be a $1 billion company. And I probably shouldn't say this because it's being recorded, but we may become a $50 million company. Meh, maybe, if we're lucky. <laughs> Right? But I, of course, I tell them we'll be oh, half a billion and in three years we'll be. <laughs> this is what it's all about <laughs> for investment, tragically, tragically. And so where is the accountability that we providers, that frankly patients are feeling, why isn't it being applied to the, to the digital health community? Uh, I'm showing here a highlight of the 2014 digital health startups and the amount of money that they were able to raise. These are big dollar amounts. I apologize the y-axis isn't particularly clear, but these are hundreds of millions of dollars, big numbers. So it doesn't even matter. It's just numbers that individuals can't really conceive. Although I did have a recent uh, entrepreneur tell me that he was post-economic. Um, he sold a couple of companies like, oh, I don't care about money. I'm post-economic. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so this is, this is what it means. Money doesn't matter to these people. Um, and so we thought, wouldn't it be an interesting study to look at the top 100 most funded companies and see is there actually evidence for what they're marketing, for their claims? And uh, so my colleagues at Institute for Healthcare Improvement, another one of my colleagues from Startup Health is also an entrepreneur and a statistician. We reviewed the top 100 companies and what we found was only 23% of the top 100 funded companies in 2014 actually had peer-reviewed evidence for their marketing claims. This isn't like a blog post that says, oh, we can reduce readmission. This is a front and center on their homepage. We've reduced readmissions, period. And they're making a lot of money, and they're getting a lot of investment, and yet they had absolutely no peer-reviewed research. That, to me, is a bit of a problem when everyone else is being held accountable for outcomes. Another, and so this is just a distribution of the level of funding for each of the companies and the p-value, of course, we get to a p-value. So the p-value was much greater than 0.05. It wasn't even close when we did the correlation between investment amount and uh, the level of peer-reviewed evidence. Now, a phenomenon that happens here is actually really nicely summarized by the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and the Gartner hype cycle explains a phenomenon of inflated expectations. In other words, when a new technology comes on the scene, people get really excited about it, and there's a lot of attention paid on it, and there are decisions made, purchasing decisions and investment decisions, because something seems exciting, and it, there's a scarcity phenomenon that happens. I exploit this with investors all the time, say, oh, that guy in New York is investing, and the guy in San Francisco is like, oh, I need some, and they're just throwing money, and like, ah, oh, you don't even know what I have, and <laughs> this is what it's all about, and the, the, um, Proportions of this figure aren't quite as stark uh, as I intended. It's supposed to be like a really steep peak. Uh, and what we're finding is, again, really small print here, but I'll just read to you some of the technologies at the, at the peak, right? Big data, predictive analytics, care coordination, blah, 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 blah. like everything you hear that everyone is doing, everyone's preventing admissions or readmissions, like so what? Where's your evidence? Nobody has it. Um, so I propose to you all four of my guide, these are not guidelines, these are just ideas that I happen to submit for a lot of uh, NPRMs and requests for comments. And I, this is something that I, everyone in my company adheres to, all of my advisors have suggested this. So this is a distillation of a lot of smarter people than I that, that kind of guided this, uh, me in this direction. First principle is that technology, like every other intervention in healthcare, should be evidence-based, peer-reviewed. Number two, the reality is that it's really hard to convince investors to actually give you money to do research because the lifetime of research is far beyond the, you know, you got to be a billion dollar company in five years. So two is, well, if you don't have peer-reviewed evidence, at least use rigorous quality improvement methods to demonstrate your impact in a short period of time in a controlled setting. Much smaller dollar amounts to achieve that. It's actually very feasible. Third point is we should measure the quality of our impact not by dollar signs and frankly not just by our traditional HEDIS measures, even though they're great, 
But what about more consumer, not patient, centered measures? What about preferences, goals of care, home and community-based services, all the other real stuff, not just what I as a doctor do in terms of antihypertensives for my pediatric <laughs> congenital heart failure patients, but you know what I mean? It's not just the medical stuff. And fourth is we should have technologists go at risk for our outcomes. Uh, and so I'll highlight just briefly what we've tried to do in that regard. Our hypothesis was, and what we're showing here on the x-axis is time, y-axis is hospitalization risk. Our hypothesis was these blue dots are the doctor-patient interactions, and that is really the standard of risk prediction in healthcare right now. You use a claim or use EMR data, and that's how you predict risk. However, there's all these yellow dots in between the blue dots, which are the non-doctor the home care worker, the social worker, the community health worker interactions with the consumers, they're much more frequent. They're a lot less expensive than the doctor to doctor, doctor patient interaction. So we thought, what if we could somehow take these observations and translate them into actual hospitalization risk? Maybe that could inform more precise segmentation, more precise interventions, and we're already using assets that are already in the field. So we, in fact, proved that we could do that. And the way we did that was, we have existing frontline workers interacting with consumers. We give them a survey tool. The survey tool takes three minutes. It calls on 2,700 questions, very fancy algorithms. But in fact, all the frontline worker sees is 15 questions. They change each time. And about one in five of those surveys will trigger an elevated risk alert. Ta-da, big data. Like, that's it. It's very simple. It's about empowering the consumer's care team and not you know, barraging the consumer with a bunch of apps to use, and also not relying on the doctor or claims. So four principles, peer-reviewed evidence. We have three studies, pretty robust. They're not prospective, randomized, controlled trials. There's lots of limitations to them. But at least it's some kind of peer-reviewed research that shows I can go out and market and say, yes, we can reduce 30-day readmissions because here's the literature and its limitations. The other point. We also do a lot of cool stuff where we don't have research for. And so we use a lot of run charts, and we try to apply statistical-based processing to ensure that when we have a special cause, we don't say this is because of care at hand, but it may be attributable possibly to care at hand. Let's research it further. And that's a key thing that we emphasize when we don't have peer-reviewed research. <clears throat> Third point, when we measure our impact, we don't just look at what I have here in the left column, which is medical stuff. We also look at the right columns, which includes care coordination breakdowns, extrinsic risk factors like uh, food insecurity, financial insecurity, domestic violence, you know, other stuff that can lead people to go to the hospital that's not just the primary medical issue. And finally, we actually go at risk for our, out our outcomes. So this is data uh, from a colleague uh, or, or from a client organization here in Maryland where the gray bars are representing the readmission rates prior to introduction of any care transition program. The blue bars are representing the care transition program of our customer prior to them using care at hand. And the orange bars are representing after they introduced our technology. And these is, these, this is across, across three hospitals in West Baltimore. And the reduction readmission ranged anywhere from another 5 to 20 percent. We went at risk for that. So in one of those settings, we made no additional money. We went at risk as low as, as much as 15 percent discount on our licensing fee. And in the other settings, we got some bonus because we met certain thresholds. I think vendors, like providers, like employers, and certainly like patients, we need to be going at risk for our outcomes. It's critical, and we need to be held accountable for that. And it would be great to see quality measure development organizations reflect that in some of the new quality measures that are emerging. And so I'll finish with this. It's really not about tech. It's not about doctoring. It's not about investment. It's about people. It's about human beings. And like Chris pointed out earlier, it's about us being able to empathize with the human condition and build around that, and not have reimbursement and then build the human condition into that model. So, I implore all of you guys to challenge the status quo, like I am kind of spitting in the face of Silicon Valley, but please give us money too. Um, uh, and and be, be bold, be like Chris, where you can get up here and give a football speech and get everyone scared and excited. I wish I could do that, um, but I would need to gain like 200 pounds. So thank you guys very much. <laughs> <laughs>